Good morning, church family. Uh, as always, we're going to conclude this month's Easter lesson, The Awakening Power. You know, Reverend Lisa does such a fine job of coming up with these messages and these themes for us. And I'm trusting that we take the time to visit the website and look back and listen to these messages over and over again until we get them so affixed in our mind and in our consciousness that we go about living these words on a daily basis naturally. So in continuing with our theme for Easter, the awakening power. The awakening power is something that we must embrace, something that we must embody. But it requires us to spend some time sleeping. It requires us to spend some time to, to, in a conscious restoration. What happens to us when we awaken? What happens when we awaken from sleeping? What results when we still our minds and our outer thoughts and listen to that still small voice within us? In the stillness, you see, that's when we rest in our truth. That's when we commune with the Lord. And after we rest in God, we awaken to the Christ presence within us. We embody the awakening power, the resurrection power demonstrated by Jesus the Christ. The awakening power is the power to realize our true spiritual selves. The awakening power is the power to overcome death. The awakening power is a power that rises us from a dead state of consciousness. That awakening power is a power that lifts us out of a state of where we're void of our divine understanding. An awakening power elevates the activity of mind, removing all thoughts contrary to the law of God. The awakening power causes a transition from us a transition where we move away from that divided thought. We move away from that dual mindedness that causes separation of spirit and body. You see, when we crucify all ideas contrary to the image and likeness of the creator, we get to spend three days sleeping, resting in a tomb of solitude. On the first day, we're developing non-resistance and humility. On the second day, we're embracing the divine action, accepting the will of God. And on the third day, we're embodying the spiritual understanding that allows us to fulfill our divine purpose. You see, after we restore mind and body to their original state, then we can possess the awakening power, where we recognize, unify, and realize that the spirit and power of God lives, moves, and truly has its being within us. Romans 8 and 11 tells us that in the spirit of him who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead that dwells in you, so he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Christ Jesus is God's idea of man the creator's idea of itself and the awakening power within man. We demonstrate that awakening power every time we open our minds and hearts to a new life based on the living word of God. Ernest Holmes tells us that Jesus, the man, became the living embodiment of the Christ. He also reminds us that Christ is a principle, not a person. He tells us the life, words, and actions of Jesus reveal the principles of the law and love of God. You see, when the human gives way to the divine, when the flesh is subdued by spirit, then, like Jesus, we can lay hold on that awakening power. The Christian community teaches us that the only way to salvation, the only access to the road to heaven, requires acceptance of Jesus as Lord and a belief in his awakening power. 
You see, Jesus had only one mission, and that mission was salvation. His thoughts revealed righteousness and perfection. His words informed us of our spiritual birthright, and his actions demonstrated freedom from all limitations. You see, salvation is an inner overcoming. Salvation is a change in consciousness. Salvation is a cleansing of the mind that we must follow the Christ into. Our atonement comes from our inner acceptance and outer expression of the Christ, not just the activities that he did on our behalf. Yes, he is a way show. To be saved, we must emulate his thoughts, his words, and actions. In our text, Finding the Christ, Ernest Holmes tells us that Christ is a universal presence. His awakening power is accessible to all, but can only be revealed at the level of our faith and understanding. Like Jesus, our flesh must give way to spirit. Our division must give way to unity and her humanness must give way to the divine. Jesus understood his true nature. He knew the human body embodied the divine and could manifest the Christ nature. He located the kingdom of heaven within himself. He plunged beneath the material of creation and found the spiritual cause he called the Father, which art in heaven. So you see, it's true when they tell you that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Because no one comes to the Father except by his consciousness. The Bible is correct when it tells us that nobody can be saved without speaking words that heal and words of spiritual perfection. You can't come to the Father without demonstrating a deathless reality, a continuity of the soul, and a unity of spirit. You will not experience the awakening power until you overcome all fears, until you conquer death and ascend to the highest level of consciousness. The great metaphysician Charles Fillmore says that Easter, this celebration that we're in, Easter is an awakening and rising to a spiritual consciousness of the I am in man, which has been dead in trespasses and sin and buried in a tomb of materiality. He's telling us the awakening power allows Easter to be a moment by moment experience, not just an annual celebration. You see on Easter Sunday, Jesus demonstrated what a renewal of the mind can do. So it doesn't matter your perceived problem. You should have no concern about the sticky situation or the difficult circumstance, because everything in our human experience is temporary. That's why on Good Friday, Jesus said, Father, into thy hand I commit my spirit. He was proclaiming, I'm ready to give up my mortal consciousness and all of its attachments and merge into a spiritual mindset that replicates the power of the Father. The last step before the regenerative process begins with giving up the corporal body temple. So every time our developing soul overcomes an error of thought, a crucifixion takes place. Then your body of affairs can be restored to its spiritual perfection. As good as this human experience can be, I want you all to know we're just simply leasing this space when we should be looking forward to home ownership, a permanent eternal presence. After all, on Easter, the last enemy was destroyed. On Easter, Jesus overcame death. Now, most of us define death as a physical delusion or absence of life in the body. But metaphysically, death is a result from falling short or not adhering to spiritual law, which the Bible refers to as sin. And sin is simply the discord in the mind, 
negative thinking that produces separation of spirit and body. That's why Romans 6 and 23 says the wages of sin is death. Phil Morris goes on and he stresses that death is not a friend, but an enemy. Death does not change man and bring man into resurrection and eternal life. What he's telling us is the Easter story is a story of your spiritual life, not a story of physical death. You can be born again right where you sit. Your awakening power can be used at any time because it has an eternal battery that cannot be exhausted. The new birth is a change that comes in the here and now, not the hereafter. The resurrection is a confirmation that the end of our physical maladies is the beginning of our eternal spiritual wholeness. My good friend and mentor, Reverend Amon says, resurrection is a spiritual transition of the mind. That's why 2 Corinthians 5 and 8 says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Religious inference suggests that death and the grave is the gateway to spiritual growth and eternal expression. As I shared with my friends last week at Guidance, there are folk who claim to be saved and sanctified, who claim to be traveling on the highway to heaven. That when arrival time comes, when they reach that heavenly off-ramp, they keep driving that physical car that runs on regular gas, rather than transition to a vehicle that requires spiritual premium. You see, we fight to stay on this ground floor apartment when the top floor penthouse is available and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. In our humanness, we see physical death as the worst thing that can happen to us, when in truth, it's the death of our spiritual likeness and divine understanding that should cause us grief. You see, when we recover from an illness, we call it a blessing. But when we lose a loved one, when a loved one transitions, we call that pain and grief. But if, if we embody the awakening power of the Christ, then transition then can become a time of celebration, not because of a physical absence, but because of the spiritual acceptance of the Christ consciousness. Now, I don't know how your Bible reads, but when I read mine, it tells me that spirit never dies. It tells me love never dies. It tells me that Christ couldn't die. And it tells me that you don't have to. If you embrace your spiritual truth on this side, you'll maintain that spiritual awareness on the other side. I've been doing this now for 25 plus years and most of my early ministry was spent eulogizing and dealing with families in a state of grief. And the one thing that I always felt to be a challenge for me was to draw that fine line between taking an affirmative position about what's to come and dealing with the reality of what is. And I often refer to situations where grandma lives to be plus 90 years of age. And her greatest desire all of her life, all she ever talked about was being with the Lord. But when she gets her wish, there are those who want to jump in the casket with her. Now, before you start calling Reverend Gerald insensitive, I want you to know that you can't do what Reverend Lisa does. You can't do what Reverend Gerald does. You can't do what Dr. Ronnie does and what Reverend Amon does and Reverend Paul does unless you have a deep understanding of human emotion. Showing empathy and expressing sympathy is what being more like Jesus is all about. And I am no hypocrite. I know firsthand what grief is. 
I've spoken words of comfort and truth at the service of my 98-year-old father and my 91-year-old mother. I have felt the pain of losing two of my closest friends in life. My high school road dog and college roommate, Billy Ray Nash Jr. And my brother, Indugu Chancellor, who was like a brother to me for over 50 years and a neighbor for 25 years. And all of you who know me well, you know that I will cry at the drop of a hat. But when we lose someone close to us, we go from this can't be to why me? Oh, I wish I could change these circumstances to I can't go on. And finally, we come to a point where it's going to be okay. We miss them. Yet we can commune with them at any time. Through God's greatest gifts, imagination and telepathy, those spiritual senses that never die, we can have a spiritual Zoom conference with them tonight. You see, Jesus demonstrated you can't change your life or the life of others if you fear death. No one wants to leave the known for the unknown. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to try and stay here as long as I can and enjoy as much as I can. But if we trust him, like we say we do, if we choose a metaphysical understanding of Easter, then physical death won't be the worst thing that ever happens to us. Spiritual ignorance will. You see, the idea of the resurrection makes the human unknown a spiritual fact. That's why I'm on a mission to minimize the impact of physical death and magnify the importance of spiritual life that cannot die. You see, we all know the Easter story and the events that led up to the resurrection ascension of Jesus Christ outlined in the four gospels. The truth is the entire Bible is a metaphorical story of our journey to return to spiritual perfection and the experiences and expressions we endure on the way to our Easter transformation. Our awakening power realized. However, it was the Romans who led the charge to eliminate the Christ consciousness that was awakening masses to their spiritual power. So Paul's letter to the Romans describes how willful, selfish ideas can undermine our awakening power. In Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, it says this. Know this is also that now is the time and the hour that you, you should awake from your sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we believed. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast out works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk decently as the daylight, not in the clamor of darkness, not in the practice of immortality, not in the envy and not in strife, but close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and disregard the lust of the flesh. There's an Easter story in those words. Paul is telling us as we unfold spirituality, as we express our awakening power, we can experience an abundant life eternal. He's telling us that at night, our unlimited state of mind must come into the light of spiritual illumination, realizing our awakening power. He's telling us that the armor of light is the protection and truth of understanding. He's telling us that our physical desires can lead to excessive indulgence unless the soul is spiritually saturated with the awakening power. When we walk in daylight, our behavior is righteous and good. He's telling us that when we fulfill our desires, we clothe ourselves in Christ-like ways. 
The flesh dies, allowing the awakening power of the spirit to give us a life everlasting. When we clothe ourselves in Christ, we rise to a new life, a perfect idea in mind. That's why the book says God so loved the world. He gave the son begotten of the only father. Prior to enlightening us, you see, Paul is reminding us to love one another, to obey moral laws. Paul's message is telling us that love is the fulfillment of the law and that faith in our divine nature and the expression of our divine qualities, by that faith, we can leave behind all external provisions. You see, when we participate in the Lenten season, we're leaving the external behind. When we go through Holy Week, we're leaving the external behind. When we're crucifying the desires of the flesh, we're leaving the material behind. When we resurrect our truth, we're leaving what was to embrace the truth of what is. And when we ascend to the highest peak of understanding, we're leaving this earthly expression and moving to the highest level of consciousness and understanding that we can achieve. We can, we will. We are expressing the awakening power. You see, there's an Easter message, not in that, just in that story, but there's Easter messages throughout the Bible. Even in the Old Testament, they're giving you an Easter message. And in Ezekiel, Chapter 37, 10 through 14, Ezekiel tells us this. He says, so I prophesied as he who commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood up on their feet. And exceedingly, there was a great army. Then he said to me, son of man, all these bones are the bones of children of Israel who said, our bones are dried up in hope and loss. We are completely gone. Therefore, the prophecy and say to them, thus says the Lord, behold, I am open your graves and bring you up out of them and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall now that I am the Lord, you shall know that I am the Lord. And when I have opened your graves and brought you up and out of them, and I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and you shall place your in your I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord and I have spoken it and I will do it, says the Lord God. Ezekiel is telling you that the breath, the inspiration of spirit is what produces understanding. And when we take a deep spiritual breath, the soul is energized with high ideas. When we stand to our feet, we gain the understanding and faith that comes in contact with the substance of spiritual ideas, that same bread that was shared on the Last Supper. Our spiritual strength becomes a great army of righteousness that defends us against willful personality and lustful materiality. Right thinking, he's telling us, is our greatest protection. He says the son of man, the eternal and self-existing man within all of us, will lead us to the children of Israel, those seeking spiritual consciousness. He says that those dry bones, which represents hopeless circumstances that we face in this life, he says that the prophets have said and will always say that the Lord thy God will open up the grave and bring you out of a dead state of consciousness and give you a new life. He's telling us that our awakening power will lead you to Israel, which is a place of spiritual understanding. Then you embrace your awakening power. When you embrace your awakening power, you won't just believe and have faith, 
you will know, he says, that I am Lord. I am the indwelling Christ that will set the rules and standards for your life. Like Jesus, he says, you'll come out of the grave, leaving behind all negativity and everything unlike the image in which you were created. When we awaken to the spirit of God within, we experience the awakening power, a realization of divine substance that will place you in your own land, a new body in Christ, a place of freedom from bondage and ignorance. As God promised it, as the prophets predicted, and as Jesus demonstrated, we'll recognize, unify, and realize our awakening power. Ezekiel, which is the strength of God, he's enthusiastically encouraging us to rely on a spirit that knows the way. When we touch the God consciousness, we realize the presence of that awakening power. As Fillmore told us, there was a great work for us to do. We must come into an understanding that evil is an inharmonious state of mind and that lasting happiness, health, and life eternal comes only when we live and think in harmony with the divine. The mind and the body must be fulfilled with the substance of God. We must learn we are a harmonious part of God's creation. And we may experience discord and we may experience sickness, but they are not our truth. You see, all month we've immersed ourselves in this idea of the awakening power, a power demonstrated by the life, death, and resurrection of the Christ. But unless we can infuse that same power within us, unless we can have that same awakening power become a part of our daily events and activities in our life, the time we spend celebrating and deciphering the story of Easter will be all for naught. To apply or to use what Episcopal Bishop John Shelby Spong said in his book, the Hebrew Lords, he calls it the Christ power, which is synonymous with the resurrection power and the awakening power. He says to use that power, he suggests that we first start off by getting a clear understanding and making a distinction between Jesus and Christ. He tells us that Jesus was a person, the chosen one who embodies the theological principle of the Christ. He reminds us that Jesus lived among us, that he was human, finite, and limited until he recognized the Christ within him that is divine, infinite, and unlimited. He reminds us that Jesus had a lineage, an ancestry, and a heritage, that he was born, and the Bible says that he died and rose again. But he says it's important to remember that Christ is a principle beyond the capacity of the mind of human ordinance to explain. That Jesus of Nazareth became recognized as Jesus the Christ. Some say, or go as far to say that Jesus is God. They say that because through Jesus, God was revealed fully and completely and totally. But in my opinion, who is God? is not an appropriate question because there's nothing or no one that isn't the essence of the divine. What is God is the appropriate question. God is the source of all life. God is seen whenever life is lived. God is the source of love. God is seen whenever love is shared. God is the foundation of our being and is seen whenever one has the courage to be. Jesus made known the meaning of life, the meaning of love, and the meaning of our being. He revealed God whenever God is seen in human life. He revealed God as the power of the Christ, as the awakening power. So now the question becomes, what should we do with this awakening power? 
with this awakening power, how do we use it to improve our lives and improve the life of others? Well, I would say one of the things we can do is dare to love and be loved. I would say one of the purposes of that awakening power is for us to escape the bondage of self-imposed limitations. I would say that that awakening power will expand the limits of our humanity. I will say that that, that awakening power will cause us to embrace life openly and honestly. And I would say that that awakening power should be used to touch and share with others. You see, when we fully engage the awakening power, we know that it conquers death and it's bigger than life. Jesus confronted death long before Resurrection Sunday. You see, Jesus throughout his history, throughout his travels, came in contact with situations where people were perceived to be dead. You see, when Jesus showed up, Lazarus was already in the tomb. The family was in the midst of bereavement and grief. And Jesus was so despondent because of the close friendship he had with Lazarus. The book says he wept right along with them. But he told Martha and Mary, your brother will live again. And Martha was a little sassy. She said, don't preach to me. I believe in the hereafter. I believe in the resurrection in the last days. But right now, as many of us do, I'm hurting. I'm dealing with loss, loneliness, and pain. So can you fix that, she said to Jesus. And Jesus said simply, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe I can give life now and forever? Do you believe human life touched by the Christ power that can awaken and transcend all limits. And when Martha gave an affirmative answer of faith, the God that is life and love, God's being entered into humanity through her life, through his life and through Jesus' life, and Martha's grief and emotions had to give way to the awakening power of Jesus that caused that apparent death to rise and live again. Lazarus got up. His life was restored and made whole. So you say, well, Reverend Gerald, what, what really happened that day? What happened was Martha, the outer expression of the soul was receptive to her inner spiritual teacher. The idea of youth, that new spiritual possibility was asleep in the subconscious of Lazarus. He was in a tomb waiting to be restored. But that awakening of youthful energy that is necessary for regeneration came through Jesus. It wasn't easy. That's why the book says he groaned as he made his way to the tomb of Lazarus. But see, the story of Lazarus, like all biblical incidents, have meaning beyond their literal interpretation and reveals a deep, profound truth that life, not death, is our final destination. That the awakening power can allow love to overcome hatred. That the awakening power can cause beauty to transcend ugliness. The awakening power can, can bring about a secure faith that transforms fear. The awakening power can eliminate our need for status and prejudice. The awakening power is revealed eternally, whenever eternity touches time and the gift of love calls us to live a better life. The awakening power is a power given by God. It's a power where God breathes into the life of humanity. It's a power where people that people saw in Jesus and decided to deem him the Christ all month long starting with Easter Sunday, Reverend Lisa has implored you to identify and utilize the awakening power within you. She encouraged you to stop complaining about what's wrong and use the power to make it right. She said, after all the, mo the movie that you're complaining about, 
is the script you wrote consciously and subconsciously by your thoughts, your words, and your actions believed in. She told you that your divine inheritance is waiting to be claimed by you. Reverend Lisa reminded us that divine love will meet our every need. She told you that when you pray, pray a prayer of faith without question and without doubt. Yes, she came to us with a message. She says, we are always plugged into this awakening power, but we still have to flip the switch. It's up to us to push the button in order for the change to come. When we consciously and subconsciously invite, when we consciously and subconsciously embrace, when we consciously and subconsciously claim the awakening power, all is well in mind, she told you. She said all will be whole in body, she informed you. That all is at peace in your soul and that all is good with our world. Reverend Lisa has given us all that God has given her to give us. I've done my part. All that's left is for you to do your part. And that's to awaken to the awakening power. And that's to use the awakening power. That's to celebrate the awakening power of God within each and every one of you. God bless you. Have a blessed day and have a wonderful week. Thank you, Reverend Gerald, for a wonderful conclusion to this month for a new beginning.